morning, everyone in this totally packed room, which is awesome. So I'm going to talk in English. My German is very, very limited. Even though I understand that you could deliver an entire talk in one word, I'm not going to try it. So I'm going to keep it uh, in English. I'm going to talk about API security pitfalls. By the way, I do understand a bit of German. So if you want to talk about me behind my back, you probably choose a different language. Uh, you're going to be good with any other language than those things. But API security, we're going to talk about contacting APIs. We're going to talk about web applications contacting APIs. And just to set the picture straight, I want to show you what this means in practice. So today, if you build an application, you're going to load your application first. This is typically your Angular front end, uh, your React front end, or whatever. That's going to be some web traffic loading the application. And from that point on, the application is going to run in the browser, and you're going to contact your API. In this case, I'm going to use a restaurant review application as an example. So we're going to get some reviews. We're going to get some data, get that back in the application, and you know what to do with that data from that point on. Of course, what you need to remind yourself of is that we're talking about API access. So whatever we're going to do also applies to other types of clients. Whether it's a native application or a mobile app or a web view based mobile app, doesn't really matter. It's about the concepts of contacting that API and some security pitfalls there. I only have about 40 minutes, so I'm going to be, first of all, really fast. I'm going to try to give you as much content as possible. But of course, I'm fully aware that we're going to have to, uh, we have some limitations we have to stick to. So the slides are on my Twitter feed. If you go there, you can grab a PDF. And the PDF actually has more slides than I'm going to show you here. Slides with text on it, which is more useful to look afterwards, uh, too, than some pictures on a presentation. So if you want to recap that or want to learn more, I definitely recommend you grab that PDF and look at that later on. Why am, I, why am I going to talk about API security? Because at one point in time, they almost put underprotected APIs in the OWASP top 10. This is a top 10 list of most important security vulnerabilities in web applications. And in the release candidate for 2017, they said, like, you know, API security, we see that this is becoming a real problem. We should spend some time or attention on that. Eventually, they decided to kick it out again when they redid the first release candidate. Now, that's a whole different story. But to me, this is important that this is a real problem. I also agree with kicking it out because honestly, API security is not a new problem. We see the same problems we had before, just being uh, reincarnated in an API-based context. And that's definitely um, going to be the main focus of, of this talk. I'm going to talk about problems we had before. And I'm going to talk about how they manifest themselves in APIs and what you can do specifically for your API to ensure that you are protected. Before we start, I want to set the bar. We're going to try to raise the bar in this talk, the security bar, raise it a bit higher. So we need to have a baseline. And the baseline for us today is going to be Gator. Gator is a company building smart watches, watches for children. So you can essentially buy the smart watch, put it on your kid, and tell it like, hey, this is a fancy watch, while you also sneakily have a GPS tracker. So you can track your kid wherever it's going, of course, for security. Um, but we all know what people do with that. Well, it turns out that this company well, they may have built good smart rushes. I don't know about that. But essentially, they messed up security. So Germany was like, what the hell is this? Apparently, you can track anyone's kid with this, which is probably not what you're supposed to do. You can change the location of a kid, which is also not supposed to happen with these kind of things. So Germany was like, screw this. We're going to throw it out. You are banned from selling this product in Germany because it's that bad. That's where we set the bar. So this is from 2017. Interesting, interestingly enough, at the end of last year, a group of researchers decided to look at Gator again. Like, hey, they screwed up, but well, let's be honest, everyone does at some point in time. So maybe they learned their lesson. Maybe they built a better uh, API ecosystem, a better support, with more security for their smartwatches. And they looked at the APIs. And they found something very interesting. There was a parameter called user grade equals 1. Sure, seemed to be OK. The guy said, like, what if I change the 1 to 2 and nothing happened? Hmm, what if I change the 1 to 0? Boom, admin access to the API. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a joke. Directly admin access to the full API. That's where we set the bar. We have our baseline. Before we start, a small word about myself. Thomas introduced me. I came here from Belgium. I actually have been doing security for a very long time. I did a PhD in web security with a main focus on client-side security technologies, essentially new developments in web security. I have a very broad view of the web security landscape, which makes me ideal to link concepts together, which is essentially what I do in my trainings and workshops like the one I did yesterday. So some of you here followed my workshop yesterday. I heard some good comments, so I hope that came from you. Um, I'm very grateful for that, and I had a good time. 
I'm also a Google developer expert, meaning that Google recognizes my contributions to the domain, uh, essentially conference talks and stuff like that. I'm not employed by Google. I have no relation with Google. And sometimes I'm not even a fan of Google, but that's something aside. I'm the course curator of the SecUp Dev course, which looks very similar to sec for dev but we're 15 years old, so we, we were pretty first, I think. But it's a week-long course in Belgium about secure application development. that covers the entire domain from processes to crypto to web security, container security, and what's things like that. We had our yearly edition last week, so if you want to come, that's going to be in 2020, just as a side note. And essentially, since about a... A year I became fully independent. I am running my own company called Pragmatic Web Security, which I mainly, my main activity there is training, developer training, in-house trainings with companies about web security, API security, modern front-end security, things like that. I also do some other stuff like writing and whatever. If you need help with security, send me an email. I can see however I can help you or point you to someone else that can do a better job. Enough about me. Back to our baseline, let's start improving our security. I'm going to give you a few examples uh, about the simple issues, and then we're going to dive into a bit more complex issues where there's less story time and more uh, content time. Let's start with the baseline, HTTPS. H I'm, I'm not going to talk about why you need HTTPS. Let's just assume that you need HTTPS. No questions asked. That's just the way it is. If you disagree, we should have a, a chat during lunch. I am available. Who here is using Let's Encrypt? Awesome. Who here is donating to Let's Encrypt? <laughs> That's the usual response. Seriously, Let's Encrypt is awesome. They have revo revolutionized how HTTPS works on the internet. It's available to everyone. It's in an automated way, allowing you to deploy this to millions of websites at once if you want to, which some companies have been doing. Absolutely awesome. But seriously, they run on real servers, not just out of thin air. So they actually need some money. It's a nonprofit organization. They need some money to keep things running and to improve the ecosystem. So if your company is using them, I'm not saying you personally, but if your company is using them, inform your boss that you're actually saving a lot of money by using that service and that you might want to consider donating part of that money to help support that service. I've done my duty with this, so let's move on to the technical details. When you use HTTPS on the web, it's, it's a very dirty affair. It's, the browser isn't very compatible with HTTPS because it defaults to HTTP. Browser always is going to send HTTP. If you type restograde.com, the browser is like, yeah, let's try HTTP first and see what happens, which is why you need this redirect mechanism. So any traditional web application that has been running on HTTPS for 15 years now has this redirect mechanism, telling the browser, like, whenever you try HTTP, go away, come back over HTTPS, and then we'll talk, which is essentially what you're doing here. That's a traditional web landscape. If you're doing API, development, if you deploy an API on an endpoint, this redirect mechanism makes no sense. Because on an API, you should never expect an HTTP request to, co to come in. Because here it happens because you have things like this where HTTP is added implicitly, you have stale bookmarks, you have whatever that user is using, links on the web, but with an API, you only have end or originating points where the developer is in control, where the developer can actually write HTTPS colon slash slash api.restocrate.com and so on. So you should always expect HTTPS traffic to come in. So if you have an endpoint, that brings us to the first pitfall. If you have an endpoint running only API-based traffic, honestly, you should not support HTTP. Just turn it off and force everyone to use HTTPS by default. That's the recommendation here. Of course, this does not hold if you're also serving web content from there. If you're also serving HTML pages from the same endpoint, just under different paths, then it's a different story. But if you have an API-only endpoint, you can turn off HTTP with no consequences except for that it might break for the ones still using HTTP, which is kind of intended in that case, <coughs> for everyone to use HTTPS. Of course, since we're still living in a web world, I recommend enabling HSTS. Uh, you can find enough information online about what that means in practice, just to avoid some weird bypass attacks that might exist in the browser. So this essentially tells the browser, whenever you're sending something to this domain, always use HTTPS, uh, even though it will already do that if you specify HTTPS as the endpoint by default. Brings us to the first pitfall, about 10 more to go or something. I haven't counted. Um, so let's move on. Second story is about Facebook. So there was this security researcher looking at Facebook. Facebook is a very interesting target to look at because they pay bug bounty if you find interesting vulnerabilities. And essentially, this guy found a problem in Facebook that netted him $15,000. That's a very nice payday if you manage to find that vulnerability. And the problem was on the beta side of Facebook, essentially a testing version that you can use if you want to try out new features. And it turns out that if you reset your account there, 
or on the normal Facebook page, you get a six-digit code you have to enter to prove that it's really you, and then you can continue from there. And it turns out that on the beta page, they did not limit the number of attempts you could fill out that six-digit code. So I'm not a mathematician, so I don't, I'm not going to do it in my head, but you can imagine it's not that many combinations to try out. Six digits, that goes really fast. If you can try all, of, out, all the combinations, you could reset any user's account on this beta side of Facebook, which is obviously not intentional, and that yielded a very nice bug bounty. So the pitfall here is about not having rate limiting on your API, and that's something extremely crucial. And it's actually very easy to do, well, no, it, technologically it's easy to do. Finding the right way to rate limit, finding the right parameters to watch and monitor and have thresholds, that's going to be difficult to configure and very application specific. But telling the client to go away, that's essentially very easy. There's a status code 429, uh, which essentially means too many requests. Essentially you tell the client, go away, Oh, and by the way, you can come back after this many seconds. So I want you to disappear for an hour, and within an hour, within an hour you can try again. That's essentially what you say with this mechanism. So not having rate limiting is a big pitfall. You see many APIs that allow the extraction of millions and millions and millions of records because they don't have rate limiting. You should have rate limiting in there. It's very important, uh, very crucial to implement. Ironically, many APIs do have rate limiting as a business feature. Because if you want to have multiple tiers, like the free tier, and after so this many requests you have to pay this much, and, and so on, that's also rate limiting, but not from a security perspective, but from a business perspective. So please take, pay some, oh, spend some time implementing rate limiting in your API. It's going to help against other attacks as well, like the one here. This story is from T-Mobile. T-Mobile apparently disclosed a lot of account information on their API. Whoops. What happened is that they referred to your account using your cell phone number, which is kind of a unique identifier. If you're a mobile phone operator, cell phone numbers are kind of unique. That's how they work. So uh, it's a good way to refer to an account. And what happened is, in the back end, if I access my information with T-Mobile, it would send a request using my phone number as the identifier. And the API would check if I was logged in and give me the account information. However, if I know your phone number, I could make a request to the API with your phone number. And it would check if I was logged in and give me the information. Like, wait, what? So essentially, they did check whether you were authenticated or not, but they never checked if you had permissions to access that specific piece of information, which is a, actually a very common mistake. And it's, we have seen that for ages in PHP applications using IDs, and it's called an insecure direct object reference. It's one of the major OWASP risks. It's no longer listed explicitly, I think, but it's part of broken access control. But it used to be a separate item in the OWASP top 10. So this is a real issue. And honestly, with the rise of these REST APIs, I'm kind of afraid we're going to see more and more of these issues because it's hard to spot, actually. Here's how this happens. Well, this is conjecture, but uh, from talking to developers, I can acknowledge that this is actually how things happen in practice. You have a tutorial to build a Node.js REST API in 10 minutes. Awesome. In 10 minutes, I can assure you there's not going to be any security in there. Which is okay, because you're not learning about security. You're learning about building this REST API. All is good. You build stuff like this, get a task, an identifier, you fetch the task from whatever data store you're using, and you're sending that back to the client, and everybody's happy. And then, when you have that down, you're going to look at how can I add authentication here? And you're going to find another tutorial saying like, yeah, you can do API authentication like this or that, whatever you're going to use. And then you check, uh, you add middleware, and it checks if you're authenticated, and you're good. And you try this, and you're not logged in, and the API says like 401 forbidden, are unauthorized, and then you log in, and then the API says 200, here's the data, and you're happy. However, it takes a trained security specialist's eye. You need to be aware of this. Checking authentication alone is not enough. You need to specifically check, I'm accessing a task here. Who is the owner of that task? And is that owner indeed correlated to the user accessing this specific object? And that is something that is very easy to overlook. It happens with getting information, but just as well with deleting information. This is an authorization problem. And these problems, seriously, I've seen them in real applications. You can access other people's pictures and all of those things just by knowing that identifier. It's a very common problem. And it's actually hard to overlook because you need to explicitly look for that to find that. Brings us to the lack of proper authorization information. Checking authentication status is one, but you also almost always need to check object-specific authorization rules, which is, of course, things get complicated because you need a lot of information to check that and you need to figure out how to get that information. 
which brings us to the next point. How do you get that information? Well, traditionally, you would get that from your PHP session object. Very nice, you have the session object on the server. So essentially what you build is you have a client and a backend. You keep some session data here, and whatever call comes in, you know, oh yeah, that belongs to that object. Oh, that was Philip. I'm going to give him access to this task, because that's, these are his tasks. Kind of makes sense. And this works. This used to work for a very long time. Then people started building bigger applications. Instead of this one PHP, now you have three PHP servers and a couple of clients. And this still works somewhat. But this is where things get tricky. Because now you have a stateful backend, and people are like, yeah, but now we have three servers, and we have to use session replication to make sure we have all the session information on all servers. Or we have to use sticky sessions to make sure that one session always goes to the same server so that it has the proper information. And people really hate that, even though it works. So in my opinion, this makes, works fine with a stateful backend. But some people will tell you, like, yeah, but if you do that, it's not REST. Because it's not stateless, and that's, that's not good. I don't know. The argument here should be, in my opinion, a functional argument and not a theoretical purity argument. So yes, a stateless backend does make sense in some cases. A stateless backend makes sense if you have, basically if you're something like Facebook or whatever, if you're operating at a massive scale and if you actually need that scaling, then moving to a stateless backend might make sense. But I, I can't tell you how many people have gone to this stateless paradigm because they read it somewhere like Angular is supposed to use an API and APIs are supposed to be stateless. And then they do a lot of work to implement that. They have to fix a lot of problems along the way. And then in the end, they're like, what did we achieve? Why, why did we do that? We have 50 users. We can probably support that with traditional web sessions, <laughs> which is true. You can. So if you want to go to this stateless thing, do it for the right reasons. Don't do it just because it's the way you're supposed to do things. Question these things, like why are we doing this? Do we really need that? Are we ever going to spin up more than one server? If not, honestly, I wouldn't go through all the effort of making that work. It's going to be a nightmare to do that. Yes, your API, you cannot call it a, a, a REST-compliant API, but that's about the only disadvantage, in my opinion. However, if you do have a solid reason, if you are building mass-scale applications, then this stateless paradigm might make sense. So let's take a look at what this means in practice. So in a stateful API, you keep your session or authorization state on the server. How you do that, I'm not going to talk about that. Whether it's a Java session object or some kind of a session store or whatever, you keep it somewhere on the server. That's essentially it. If you move this to the client, if you make your backend stateless, you move this authorization state to the client. And every client is going to keep its own authorization state. Very nice, very practical. And whenever you need it, the client is going to send it to you. On PowerPoint, this is very easy. It's just like taking one, uh, this is management talk. Like, yeah, just, just move that from here and, and you're good. <laughs> well, <laughs> it has a bit more implications than, than that. So now you're making authorization decisions with data kept on the client. Hmm, user grade equals one comes to mind. Probably not the best way of doing things. So you need some form of integrity protection. Absolutely crucial that this information cannot be modified by anyone else than an authorized party, which is in this case the backend. The be backend issues this information and ensures that it is protected. And the de facto standard way of doing things today is using a JSON web token. So what's going to happen is we're going to have this JWT, and that is going to contain some information, the payload here, so you can see roles, user, and restaurant owner. I'm not supposed to be able to add admin as a role there and get admin access. And if I use job correctly, this is not going to be possible because we have this signature here, the blue part, using a super secret HMAC key, which is probably not the best way of defining a secret, but this is just an example. You, you get the idea. You're, you're laughing with this, but apparently I, ha I did a talk on JOTS last week and somebody told me that they saw a hard-coded key in an application copied from a blog post from Out0. <laughs> not a joke in a real production application. So even though this seems funny, there's probably someone in the world copying this from my slides and putting this into an application. <laughs> I, I take the blame for that. That's uh, totally up to, up to me. But essentially, this signature is going to protect the integrity of this data. So whenever you modify something, a receiving backend will be like, no, 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 no. This, this is not something I created. This is something that has been modified. I'm not going to accept it. If you get it right, that is if you manage to find the right library function to use. Here's a code snippet in Java. 
This is the Java JWT library, without a doubt the most popular library in Java for doing JOT operations. If you look closely, this will get you a decoded JOT, so essentially you can access the claims I showed you here. So now you can access these roles and see if the user actually has the proper permissions to access certain features in the API. However, if you have this code in your application, I give you permission to leave my talk and go fix that because this is a major security hole. You should have done this, which is more effort, but actually the proper way of doing things. Again, not the way you encode a secret in an application, for the record. But essentially what we're doing here is simply decoding this. This is decoding only while the other one, the bottom one, verifies the signature. And this is again a mistake that happens in real applications. Because as a developer, you're looking like, how can I get this information out of the job? And if you're unlucky, you find the first example somewhere, and if you don't think about it for more than a half a second, then you might not have thought about, hey, the secret doesn't go anywhere, but that's probably okay. No, this doesn't verify any signature, while this does verify the signature. So um, please ensure that your application handles these client-side session data correctly. And this is for JOTS. There's other frameworks that do this, the same thing with cookie and same signatures in there. Uh, so there's plenty of middleware there. But the strong advice is write negative testing here. Write a test that tries to feed you a token that's actually invalid and see whether the API accepts it or not. If it gets accepted, you're in trouble. And you're lucky that it's your unit test that caught this and not someone on the internet thinking, hey, let's look at this application and see what we can do. So that's very, very, very important. By the way, JOTs also support confidentiality if you want to. So usually they're only used with integrity protection, but if you want to encrypt the data you store in there, there's a feature called JWE, JSON Web Encryption, that can enable that for you in a fairly straightforward manner. There's API implementations that support all of that, so you don't have to write your own crypto if you want to support that. All right, back to JOTs. This signature here, well, it's if you talk to a cryptographer, it's not a signature, but it's an HMAC, is something very straightforward. So essentially you feed it the input, the header and the payload, you base64 encode that, and then you give it a secret key, which is probably something else as this one, and then it will give you a unique signature over the content, which looks something like the blue part here. That's how they work in practice. Let me show you what this means in practice. So you have the data, it's gonna be fed into an HMAC function. There are specific functions, they use hash functions underneath, but they are specific HMAC functions. Don't try to roll your own. You give them the data, give them the secret key, and out comes the HMAC. And that's what you share with the client along with the data. You push it somewhere else, and the client comes back and feeds you that information again. Like, hey, here's the data I had before, and here's the signature. So what you're going to do is you're going to feed that again through an HMAC function. Well, the library is going to do that for you, but it's going to feed that through HMAC again get the HMAC out of there, and then compare both values. If they match, you know that the message was the same as the one that has been signed. And if they don't match, one of the inputs has changed. It's probably not going to be the secret key, so the data must have changed, so we're going to reject the token. We don't care what has changed. We don't care whether it's a white space or an unimportant change. It's not the same. We don't want it. Simple as that. We kick it out. All good? This works perfectly well, and almost every tutorial you work with today is going to show you how to use jobs with this mechanism. However, there's a big however here, a big caveat. This secret key is the same key for generating a signature as for verifying a signature, meaning that anyone able to verify a signature is able to generate arbitrary tokens, which is, if it is your own application, that's probably okay, but the moment you're sharing this with someone else, you're in trouble. I've heard people recommend, like, hey, if somebody else needs to verify your tokens, just give them your secret key and they can do that. <laughs> no. Seriously, there's not even debating this. No, don't do that. I don't even recommend this for two applications that you control. If one application is handing them out and the other one is consuming them, even there you should not be using the shared key. It's not a good way of doing things. There's better mechanisms, and that's called asymmetric signatures or digital signatures. Here's how that works. You have your data. You're going to push it through a signing algorithm and you're going to feed in a private key and out comes this signature. Very easy, you share it with the client and you're good to go. Whenever the client presents a job to a backend, it presents a signature and the data here, we're going to push it through the verification algorithm. You don't need to know how these libraries do that for you. You don't need to know the internals, it depends on the algorithm by the way. Don't worry about it. And this verification algorithm is going to consume a public key and it's going to give you a result, true or false basically. 
Is this valid, yes or no? If it is, then you know that the message is the same message as has been signed by the corresponding private key. If it isn't, you know that something changed and you don't really care what. Maybe it's signed by a different key, maybe it's the message has changed, you don't care. It's essentially not the right thing that you expect here. A very interesting property here is that this is used in OpenID Connect, for example. If you use login with Google, under the behind the scenes, this is mechanism is being used. Google is going to give you or give the service a token, an identity token containing information about your authentication, and it's going to sign that with Google's private key. And you can give that to another application, and the application is going to consume that. And it's going to use Google's public key to verify if Google actually signed that token and whether the data has been tampered with or not. And if it's valid, it knows that this token came from Google. So you have authenticity now. It must have come from Google, otherwise it will not have been able to be verified with that key. And you know that the data is valid, so if you trust Google, then you now know that the authentication attempt was for Philip with Google identifier a very long number, essentially. And that's how these things are used in practice. And that's the strength of this system. And most deployments of JOT need to use these public-private keys, even between your own services. Just give them public-private keys. It is a much more flexible and a much more secure system to use in practice. So don't misuse the JOT signature scheme. I know these things might get complicated sometimes, but it's actually very useful to learn how to use them, to find a proper library that supports these public-private uh, signatures, and to handle that key in your application correctly. All right. Now we're doing crypto. Hopefully you know the moment you start doing crypto that things get really complicated. One of the biggest challenges in crypto, in every crypto system, is key management. How do you know which key was used? I've been talking about Google's public key. How do you know which key is Google's public key? You can fetch it and hope you get the right one, but what if it changes over time? Keys need to be rotated. It doesn't work to hard code a key and just keep using it for the next five years. That's not what you should be doing. TLS has this key re renegotiation thingy, where they renegotiate the key very, very often. Because the moment you have used the key for a, a chunk of data, it becomes vulnerable if you use it for too much data. There's cryptanalysis techniques that can start deriving information about the key just because the volume of the data. So you should be rotating it frequently. Depends on how much traffic you have, but it doesn't hurt to do it too often. Meaning that you need a way to identify which key was used to sign a specific token. Let's say you rotate it every day. Let's say you have a very simple scheme where you call your keys Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And we, we're not open for business on Saturday and Sunday. So whenever you get a token, if it's valid for four days, it might be signed with one of the previous day's key. How do you know which one? Well, the JOT spec authors thought about this. And they said, like, yeah, for the key management thing, what, the simplest form, form is the key ID. So here in the token, you can specify it was signed by a key with this identifier. What that identifier means? That's up to the application to define. So you could, for example, look up a public key corresponding, which what I'm, what I'm saying here, this is an HMAC algorithm, so you can look up the shared secret from your key store and you get the secret from Tuesday and you can verify that signature. And if you would have the identifier from Monday, then you would have gotten the key from Monday and you can verify it there as well. And this is an easy way to do key management. There's a lot more complicated things. You for, could, for example, also include a URL pointing to a JSON file defining keys, and then you could use a key from that file to check the uh, signature. Uh, I'm not going to go into that much detail here. If you want to know more, talk to me after uh, during one of the breaks. But the pitfall here is that you have to think about key management up front. This is not something that you deploy in a hard-coded way and put on your backlog like, from, yeah, maybe in a year we should look at key management. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to think about this up front, and it's not an easy problem to solve. OpenID Connect has solved it somehow using discovery and finding the proper keys at the moment you initialize the protocol. But if you are not using that, if you're using custom JOT uh, scenarios, then you'll have to think about this yourself and implement something yourself. This is not to be neglected. Very, very important. All right. We talked about JOTs a lot. Like we have some authorization state which magically appears in the backend, which you can now verify. But how do you get it there? Well, you send it from the client to the server. Can't be that hard, right? Well, on the web, it's never that easy. So traditionally, we used to do that with a cookie. Very traditionally, in your PHP application, you would have a PHP session ID cookie, and it would have a value. Probably not 42, but 
you get the idea. It's a long and random session identifier. That's the old system. Nobody likes that. Then people started building Angular apps, and they're like, yes, but all our requests come from JavaScript now, from XHR. We have control over what we send. What if we add this custom header authorization with type bearer and a JWT token here? Then we can get rid of cookies once and for all, and everybody is going to live a much happier life. Well, th the intentions were definitely good, but you know what they say. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And even here, it turns out it's not that simple. And you have a lot of confusion here. I can show you a hundred tutorials saying you have to do it like this. I've also heard people that this doesn't work with APIs. And my response there is like, what? Why not? We're still on the web. Why wouldn't it work? What's the problem with even putting a jot in a cookie? Why not? What's the problem with putting an identifier in an authorization header? This is just a way to transport information. What you put in there makes no sense or makes no difference what's whatsoever. They have different properties. That's what matters. But it's the way you represent your data is completely independent of the way you transport that data. So if anyone ever tries to compare cookies to tokens, just tell them, like, what are you comparing? It makes no sense. What they probably mean is this versus that. That's a whole different story. Because you can perfectly well put a jot in a cookie, and in some cases it makes a lot of sense and it will make your life a lot easier. Here's a small comparison of what this actually means. So in both types of transport, you can put whatever you want. You can put a jot token in there, you can put an identifier in there, nobody cares. If you can encode Pokemon in Base64, you can put that in there, the browser will not complain. The backend might not be very happy with that, but whatever. Works very well. Cookies have one drawback, is that they only work well with a single domain. They're linked to a domain, the browser will send them to that domain only, and will not send them to somewhere else. If you don't believe me, look, take a look at what happens if you log in to accounts.google.com. You will see in the background that the browser is contacting YouTube and all other kind of domains to tell it like, hey, I logged in here, can you please uh, ensure that you set some cookie to track my session later on if I go to YouTube. Very Non pretty with the authorization header, you can send that header wherever you want. You have full control. You're sending the request from JavaScript. If you say add a header, it goes out. No questions asked. Cookies are handled automatically by the browser, which is, in my opinion, awesome. You don't have to write a single line of code to make cookies work. The authorization header, that's custom code in your application. Your Angular app will have to have an interceptor that actually intercepts requests, add the header, and sends them out. That's a point where you can make a mistake and cause a problem. Then cookies are always present, even on resources loaded from the DOM, script tags, image tags, and on WebSocket connections, for example. The authorization header will not be there. This is actually a problem that we see quite often, that people start using this, and then they come across a scenario with a WebSocket, and they're like, oh crap, we have no authorization information. And I've seen people then add a second mechanism using cookies to make sure that for that scenario there is a cookie, and then I'm asking, what the hell are you doing? Why are you using the authorization header in the first place? Maybe cookies work better in your scenario. You can still put your jot in a cookie if you want a stateless backend, sure, if you take a few things into account. But think about the impact of this transport mechanism. This is something that really, really, really matters. So don't underestimate that impact. I've been warned that I only have five minutes, so we're going to need to pick up some space here. Let me maybe skip a few slides, otherwise... Um, it's not going to be useful for you if I go through it too quickly. So, let's skip here. What do you think about this? Is this valid input for your API, yes or no? Sure. sure. What are you building? Well, it's text, right? It's text. Yeah, yes, absolutely. You might guess, since it starts with a 1, you might guess that the API actually intended a number as input, but hey, you don't know. So your answer is absolutely correct. Do you want that input? Probably not. Brings us to input validation. Yes, it's probably, well, if it's SQL injects your application, you have other problems. But that's essentially what the attacker is trying to do. So the pitfall here is lack of input validation. Many people have an API that accepts that and are then surprised when it gives some problems later on. Don't do that. Input validation is absolutely crucial as a first line of defense. It keeps the crazy out. <laughs> da data, 
data you don't expect. If you expect a number, parse the thing as a number. Modern frameworks today, if you build a, a Java backend, it's going to be Spring very likely, and that framework allows you to define request parameters. Int ID, and if it's not an int, it's going to be like, screw this, I'm out of here. And it's going to reject the request automatically. You don't have to do it. But having something like this in place is really important. And force whatever you can enforce at input time. There's going to be limits to this. What do you think about that? Is that a valid email address? Who's, who says yes? One guy, two guys. Did you write the spec? <laughs> yes, yes, all right, awesome. This is a valid email address. According to the RFC for email addresses, this is completely valid. My provider doesn't think so because I'm not allowed to make it, but uh, that's a different story. But this is valid. Well, besides the fact that this leads to SQL injection if you do it wrongly, this is valid data that injects your database, which is not the whole point. But essentially, what I want to show here is that input validation has its limits. You cannot rely on input validation as a primary line of defense because at once the data beca becomes complicated enough, you're going to run into problems. So, like I said, input validation is absolutely crucial to keep the crazy out, but it's only a first line of defense. After that, you have to rely on other defenses, cross-site scripting defense, SQL injection defense, and so on and so on. Keep that in mind. Never, ever, ever apply input validation as a primary or only defense. Always have it have a second defense that is much more effective at stopping attacks. In this case, it would be preventing SQL injection with parameterization, just as a, a bonus topic there. Brings me to the final one. What happens when things go wrong? Perfect way to use this emoticon in a PowerPoint, by the way. And that's a problem that I often also see, is a failure to compartmentalize. And this is one of the most complex topics I may mention in this presentation. So there's a very good example is the Gator I talked about in the beginning. They had admin access to a, a default API. They had one big monolithic API doing everything. Why not build a separate admin API running on a separate domain using a separate backend, using stricter authentication, whatever you want to enforce there. And this is so important towards the future. And this is important both for front-end applications and for back-end applications. Stop building everything in one big happy interface, one big happy API, but start splitting things up based on sensitivity levels. Because this will ensure that if something goes wrong in place one, it doesn't automatically spread to place two. Maybe it will. Maybe it will escalate, but it doesn't automatically result in a full compromise. Having a SQL injection in your search feature for public data should not leak user passwords stored in the database. It makes no sense to have this as a consequence of that. It brings me to the end. Question everything. Whatever you're doing, you're building applications with a new paradigm, think about what you're doing. Does it make sense? Why can't we keep using whatever we understand and have been using for 15 years? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Use technical arguments there. Yes, it's a problem because we are running into this wall and we cannot fix it with that mechanism. Yes, that's a valid argument. Yeah, that guy on that blog post said so. Yeah, pretty much not a valid argument. Unless you have a technical argument, I recommend to stick to what you know and keep it there. If you want to know more, there are some cheat sheets on security, one on Angular security, one on JSON web token security. Um, I recommend you go there and grab a copy. <coughs> the slides are also available on Twitter, so you can use cascading to find that. And I'm also running a web security course in Belgium. If you want an excuse to visit Belgium, that's also perfect. It's April, so, well, I would say the weather is nice, but in Belgium you never know. So um, let's hope that the weather is nice. <laughs> and that brings me to the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you for paying attention. You can reach out to me on Twitter. There's useful information there on security. So definitely follow me. I highly recommend that, even though I'm the guy tweeting, but whatever. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Philippe. Give him a warm applause. <laughs> Probably the most important question, can we reach you via Philippe one in unequal to one uh, at pragmaticwebsecurity.com. Is that a valid actual email address that, can, that we can use? No, like I said, um, I'm using Fastmail and I tried to create it and they're like, yeah, it no, go, we're not, we're not doing okay. that. So if you can convince them to allow it, then sure. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't asked, honestly, so. Uh. All right. Okay, there are some questions on site. I'm gonna go through them uh, quickly. Um, 
Question number one, should generic API, API rate limiting be done on a user basis, IP basis, or both? What would you recommend as a first step or starting point, a generic starting point? Interesting. Um, like I said, identifying the proper way to rate limit is not easy. That's a hard task. My, honestly, my first recommendation is have global rate limiting. Like you see these breaches where people used an, an insecure direct object reference to extract millions of accounts. Honestly, if your normal usage is 1,000 requests per hour, a rate limit of 2,000 per hour is probably very sensible. And anything that goes above your 1,000 or 1,500 per hour should result in notifications like, hey, we see an, an awful lot amount of traffic here. Can you maybe check what's going on? Things like that will actually help you catch, well, limit these generic attacks, but also catch the first things. Authentication endpoints should be monitored for spikes in authentication attempts. Because the moment a data breach leaks, people are grabbing those username and passwords and trying them out on all kinds of websites. So the moment you see that peak, you might want to limit and reduce the performance a bit just to make sure that if it's an attack, it's less successful. That's what things like Spotify and those things are actually actively doing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you, sorry, and then of course yeah. you can start digging into the specifics like if you can do it per user, sure. You can try to do it per client if you have some kind of client identifier. Uh, but there's always going to be ways around that. So it's never going to be an airtight solution because I can use a botnet or I can go over a million users uh, one by one, things like that. But having at least something in place is a good start and then fine tune along to your needs. But in the end, it's going to depend on the application, the data that, yes. that it carries. Uh, one more final question about JSON Web Tokens because you told us that they might be valid session tokens or might not, depends on the case. Uh, People seem to, seem to be struggling with one thing, or one person at least. How can we handle session idle timeout when using JSON Web Tokens, so stateless tokens as session tokens? Is well, it impossible? You're kind of opening a can of worms here. So uh, <laughs> um, JSON Web Tokens are not well suited for implementing a session management-based mechanism. Even though many people are doing that, there's a lot of pitfalls you want to address, such as session idle timeout, revoking an act active session, and things like that. JSON Web Tokens have an expiration date, so if you really want to implement something like that, you could um, have a short expiration date in the token and reissue a new token with a new expiration date every time a request comes in. You might want to split it up into separate tokens, something like that, but honestly, trying to implement something like this is a very strong indicator that you probably are misusing uh, JOTs for what they are intended for. They're intended to exchange claims between parties in a secure way, not to mimic cookie-based session management by keeping stuff on the client. So that, that's my main message here. And more details, we can talk about that offline. All right. Thank you very much, Philippe. Give him one more applause. Thank you.